Hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. This is the question show. Of course, we're generating tons of news. We're having tons of interviews, news segments, stuff on Universe Today. It's making a lot of questions in people's minds. And this is the chance to answer them all. Now, uh, we've got a special code that we put up in the top corner. I believe it's in this corner, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, and that code is going to be the the essentially the code for the question and you can vote just write down the code. Wherever you are in your comments, you can just just write the code or include it as part of your question or whatever. And then we'll count them up and we will celebrate the winner. And so two weeks ago's episode, uh, the winner was Gaurav Sharma about whether James Webb can use gravitational lensing to look all the way back to just moments after the Big Bang. So congratulations, Gaurav. It was a total win. You had more votes than almost all the rest of the questions combined. So congratulations. It was a great question. Uh, and it was a fun question to answer. So again, vote for your favorite question. And that sort of gives us feedback about what's working and what we should uh, what we can improve. All right. Let's get uh, let's get into the questions. C tac delta. Will we get a Star Trek Voyager flyby of the sun where Parker gets low enough that it might interact with solar prominences at its closest planned approach? How far away will it be compared to a prominence? We talked about how close Parker solar probe is going to be getting to the sun and actually it's almost as close as its closest point. So during its most recent flyby, it got within 6.4 million kilometers of the sun. And it's expected once all of its flybys are done, when it's finished its orbits, it'll be about 6 million kilometers. So it's pretty close already and experiencing the full brunt of the sun. Just for comparison, a prominence, these are of course, when you get like a flare on the surface of the sun, you can have these enormous blasts of material rise up from the surface of the sun. And the biggest on record is about 800,000 kilometers. So compare a prominence can reach about 800,000 kilometers, while Parker Solar Probe will get within 6 million kilometers. So it's still quite a big gap. So we're not going to get the situation where Parker is flying, weaving its way through solar prominences as they're blasting off the surface of the sun. Interestingly, on its most recent flyby back in February, a prominence was released directly in the path of Parker Solar Probe, and it took it just face on. And no problem. It was able to handle the material that was coming off the sun. It didn't disrupt its electronics or anything. So that spacecraft is tough. Now, will it get closer than 6 million kilometers? Maybe. I mean, when the spacecraft reaches the end of its primary mission, we tend to see that NASA will extend missions. Now, they may just extend it to just have it continue in the same orbit, just gathering more and more data, trying to see more interesting stuff on the surface of the sun. But when it's really reaching the end, and it's, you know, probably only got like a year of life left in it or whatever, then they'll may send it closer and closer to see if they can get better final resolution images before the spacecraft finally dies. So who knows how close it's gonna get, but I don't think it's ever gonna get within 800,000 kilometers of the sun. That's that's really close. Yora, what is the smallest mass for a star to have reached the red giant stage at the current age of the universe? So the sun, our sun, is going to live a total of about 12 billion years. And we're about 4.5 billion years after the sun formed. So it's got another seven and a half billion years to go before it runs out of fuel, bloats up as a red giant and then shrinks back down and becomes a white dwarf. And this is the fate of all the stars that are in the main sequence stage of their lives, kind of like the sun, with roughly the same kind of mass as the sun. But you can have stars that are a little more massive than the sun and a little less massive than the sun. And the the time that a star is going to live is really purely based on the amount of mass that's collected into its shape. So the sun, if you is a type G star, and specifically, there are 10 different levels for G stars to go from level zero to level nine, the programmer in me really likes that they start at level zero. So the sun is a G two star, and the least massive star would be a G nine star. And the sun with one solar mass will live for 12 billion years. And a G nine star will have about 90% of the sun's mass and will live for about 14 billion years. So 
a star with about 90% the mass of the sun, if it was born immediately after the Big Bang, would be almost ready to en enter its red giant phase now. But obviously, stars are born at, at different ages. So roughly that. And it's really interesting that astronomers use stars turning into red giants and then turning into white dwarfs as a way to measure the age of globular clusters. So you can look at a globular cluster, and they are essentially the age of the universe itself, the age of the galaxy they're within, they're born just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And astronomers know that because they've looked at the stars inside the globular cluster, and they can't see stars of certain masses of certain brightnesses that are still around, they've all died. And that tells you essentially how long the oldest star that hasn't turned into a red giant yet defines the age of the globular cluster. And it's pretty cool a technique for being able to just figure out the age of things like that. So I actually was able to find a cool tool to be able to calculate this again, Wolfram Alpha, not a sponsor. Um, but at Wolfram Alpha, I just typed in lifetime of a star with 0.9 solar mass. And you get the answer that you need. And you can mess around with the with the mass to see the age of, of different stars. So have fun. Again, Wolfram Alpha, if you can think of a way to describe what you're trying to express as a calculation, you can usually get it done. I love it. Malprior vids, aliens have to adhere to all the laws of physics as we see them. Why would we make that assumption? Are you saying that we know everything there is to know? Yes, I'm saying right now, here we are 2022, we've figured out everything that is possible to know, no new things will ever be figured out ever. No, of course not. Um, all I'm saying is, is that, you know, we we're talking about how if aliens have to obey the laws of physics, as we understand them, then we would be able to detect the fusion plume, the heat released by their fusion drive or whatever system they're using, because they're going to have to produce a tremendous amount of energy. And they're going to have to use that energy, have to bleed it off in terms of heat, and we would see the heat signature, it would be very bright, because the amount of energy required to go from star to star is a lot, and we would be able to see it. Now, obviously, there are technologies and, and laws of physics as you know, we, we, pro we don't understand the laws of physics, we can't make quantum mechanics and gravity talk to each other. So obviously, there are things that we are missing. But if we can't use what we know so far, then we can't really speculate about what can and can't be. And so people ask me, can we see aliens coming towards us? Well, if they're using laws of physics, as we don't understand them, then the answer is no, because we can't imagine what they could be using, but then there's no point. And so when you sort of use that term, you're essentially saying that it might as well just be magic. And that's why I use unicorn tears as my explanation. Um, that all we can do is make predictions, estimates, guesses, theories, based on the laws of physics as we understand them today. And that gives you a certain space. You know, if you imagine a sphere and if one sphere contains all the laws of physics that, that we understand very well, then we have a larger sphere that is like the laws of physics that we can imagine and maybe detect and maybe be able to sense. And then around that is the laws of physics as they truly are. And if we can't sense them, if we can't imagine them, then it might as well be magic. And and this is a, you know, this is an argument that's used quite a lot against people saying, well, aliens could be blocking out the light from Tabby Star or aliens could have sent a spacecraft to Earth from, you know, Oumuamua could be an alien spacecraft or that strange blast that we saw in some other galaxy could actually be aliens firing their giant laser and sending their light sail ships from star to star. As soon as you invoke aliens, you're literally invoking magic, and then the aliens can do anything. And so could, could the fact that I'm, you know, could the fact that the internet exists be aliens? Yeah, could be. Could, could the fact that trees are green be aliens? Yeah, maybe, you know, if aliens can do anything, that could be one of the reasons. And so as soon as you say, well, could aliens do this thing? And remember that you don't have to be stuck to the laws of physics, as you understand them, then all bits are off. It's magic. And and aliens can do whatever wizards can do. Four six. Fraser Kane has become too comfortable with the cynicism and narrow mindedness unsubbed. I guess it's sort of related to the previous question. It's funny. Um, 
when I listen back to old episodes of astronomy cast, and, you know, 640 episodes ago, 15 years ago, after I'd shortly started doing universe today, I just read the case for Mars, I was totally excited about colonizing Mars, uh, I read pale blue dot, Carl Sagan read all that stuff, I was super enthusiastic and excited. And if you listen to the episodes of astronomy cast, I'm often spitballing these crazy ideas with Dr. Gay, and she's sort of going, well, you know, they like I appreciate your enthusiasm, but here's the laws of physics as we understand them. And, and, you know, and I've been at this job for 23 years now, and you sort of gain a just an understanding of which ideas have been thought through well, and there's engineering and we're around the border, you know, around the corner from being able to do that. And then other things that, that it's just question mark, question mark, question mark. You know, like, what's your plan? What's your plan for getting underpants? Profit. Um, so what you may see as cynicism, or what I'm sure some people see as cynicism, um, is, is me being, I think, more wise, more experienced, more working within the reality of just how the situation is today. But I focus all my energy like I hope this comes through if you look at the people that I'm interviewing, like, let's turn the sun into a gravitational lens, let's build a telescope out of out of some kind of viscous fluid flying in space. Let's dig down under the ice in Europa to see if we can find your open space whales. Let's figure out new and interesting ways to detect aliens like, like my time is spent imagining and talking to the people who are imagining what comes next. What are the actual practical space telescopes, missions, ideas that will push humanity farther, because that's where the progress is made. I'm always open, you know, if someone ever wants to deliver evidence of flying saucers, I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, tell me where, where, you know, when they can pick me up and we can go for a, a test flight. I can't wait. Um, so, so it is interesting, like, I think it's a journey. And, it, and I'd be interested to see sort of what you think, in your own journey, as a as a person who's been a fan of space and astronomy, you know, some of you have watched from when the Apollo landings happened, and remember the excitement and enthusiasm to see those first people step out on the moon, and wonder, like, why haven't we gone back? And then others like me were born in the space shuttle era, where the thing flew 100 times plus. And with science fiction sort of causing us all to have these wild imaginings and fantasies about what is possible. But again, the laws of physics are harsh mistress, and we have to sort of deal with the universe that we find ourselves in, not the one that we want. So I'm definitely not cynical and narrow minded, I don't think. But let me know. I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts. Do you think that that I should be? I don't even know. Tell me what you think. Coslo 1247. Any idea what the night sky is like on Mars? Like Earth? More clear? Less? What kind of view would we have looking up at night? It would be like the best, darkest skies that we have on Earth, and then a little better. The atmosphere on Mars is very thin, 1% the thickness of the Earth. And so you've just got less of that atmospheric turbulence that's getting in the way of your view to the night sky. And so it would be like almost as good as having a space telescope, except you'd be sitting on the surface of Mars. And I say almost like there's nothing as good as having a space telescope, but still it would be terrific. Now you would get the dust. So if there was a dust storm, a global dust storm, the ones capable of darkening and killing rovers, that would be trouble and you wouldn't be able to see anything. And that would be the equivalent of clouds, but they're fairly rare when they happen and they go away again. And the rest of the time, it would be a very clear view to the night sky. Saravana Prasad Venkata Subramanian. Is there a size limit for a black hole or do they just grow endlessly? There is no size limit. Black holes can grow endlessly. As long as there's material to feed on, black holes will grow and grow and grow. And you can imagine in the far, far future, there will be black holes because you know, all the stars will have died. Um, all the galaxies will have just died. There will be black holes. Then and over time, everything will find its way into a black hole until you end up with black holes, like a lot of big black holes and black holes will merge. And then you will also have stuff that just has avoided 
falling into a black hole, which is perfectly reasonable to expect. Even like the cosmic microwave background radiation will fall into black holes and just continue to make them bigger. And the only thing that will stop them from making them bigger is in the distant, distant future, when they start to evaporate again, because the there's just not enough material falling into them. But it's like a one followed by dozens of zeros years before that starts to happen. But until that, and they're just going to keep feeding and feeding as long as there's material to fall into them, but eventually they'll run out like it's just like everything will have either fallen in or will be on stable orbits moving away from them. And they won't be able to grow anymore. Selena girl 69. Do black holes eat dark matter? Yeah, in theory, we know that that dark matter has some kind of gravity to it. So it's definitely attracted to other mass. And so if a piece of dark matter falls into a black hole, it should go in and add to the mass of the black hole. We don't know what it is, but we know that it'll add to the mass of the black hole. Hannes Mahid. What does it take to get high speed internet to Mars? I'm aware of the lag, but how could we reach gigabyte per second speeds? Right. So when you're living on Mars, you have to adhere to the laws of physics, and you have to wait for the speed of light for any communication to go back and forth to Mars. And at its closest point, it's just a few minutes, four minutes, I think three minutes. And at its longest point, it's in the tens of minutes it's long. And there's no getting around that. So you're going to have big ping times if you're going to play some game. But the other part of it is the is the bandwidth, what is the total amount that you can communicate back and forth. And the farther away you go, in terms of communication, the slower the bandwidth goes. So just to give you an example, right now, the New Horizons spacecraft is well beyond the orbit of Pluto. And it is sending data back in bytes per second, even though it's got a fairly powerful transmitter and Earth has a 70 meter radio telescope that is capturing the data from from New Horizons, it still is only able to, to transmit in bytes per second, because the distance is so far, the signal weakens, it's really hard to get good data. So Mars is going to be kind of in, in the middle. And the only way to do it is going to be some kind of giant transmitter between Earth and Mars, that is capable of sending and receiving data that can not lose a lot of signal over that vast distance in between. And at the end of the day, you're going to be limited, like it, you're going to get movies, you're going to live on Mars, you're not gonna be able to access the World Wide Web, you're not going to really be able to access stuff in real time, you're going to pick stuff in advance that you're going to want to download. And it's going to be fairly expensive to download data from Earth. But once it arrives on Mars, then it can be retransmitted around there. So you can imagine like there's a copy of Wikipedia on Mars, that is maintained and as new updates are added on Earth, they're synchronized on Mars, and you can check them locally on Mars, but you won't be able to get up to date information. But it's just going to be big transmitters, big receivers between the two planets. Simon Farmer, with Robert Hansen's Grabby Aliens model, have you considered that it only works if aliens remake the universe in a visible way? And maybe the aliens don't do that. We talked a bit about this in the interview that I did with Robin Hansen about this idea of the Grabby Aliens, so that that aliens, when they really get going, when they've got a really successful civilization, they're going to start accelerating their expansion of their civilization, they're going to be moving at some significant portion of the speed of light, 80%, 90%, 99% of the speed of light, as they expand outward, as they overtake new new star systems, they're going to be remaking those star systems into whatever makes the most sense for them to continue the expansion of their civilization. I'm not saying it's a good thing. Just saying that if you've got a 1000 civilizations, and one really wants to win, they're going to be the ones that spread as quickly as possible and gather up as much territory and that we would see this happening. And so what you're saying is like, what if aliens don't do that? And so sure, imagine two farmers, and you've got one farmer that goes into a acre of land and cuts in all the trees and puts in a bunch of plants and grows a bunch of food. And you've got another farmer that goes into an acre of land and doesn't cut down any trees, and carefully looks for spots where sunlight is posting through and puts a couple of plants in and is able to harvest food from the forest. One has made a very visible impact on the landscape, the other has not. But you would expect that the one that is completely turned over the 
acre of land into productive agriculture is probably going to be able to produce more crops than the one who is keeping the forest as it is. Now, you know, who knows, I'm sure a permaculture advocate would have a great argument with me. So you know, I don't know, maybe a food forest will produce more food because you got the vertical. But that's my point. My point is that if you want to maximize your profit, which the grabby aliens will want to do, they're going to want to turn everything they get their hands on into the most efficient, most useful resources that they can. And if they don't want to, then there's someone who will. And that's just like, again, you know, analogy, right? Like I don't have to run faster than than the bear, I just have to run faster than you. Well, that's a good great analogy. But the point being that for every civilization that doesn't want to completely dismantle the entire star system and use it for their own purpose, there's one that will and the one that will it, they're going to be competing in the same because there's only so much universe to go around. And so whoever can take over as much territory as they can is the one that is likely to win. And so we will see the winners in the sky, and we will not see the losers. Again, I'm not saying this is what's right or good or best. I'm just saying that this is what you would expect to see out there in the, in the universe. Now, there's, there's a really fascinating idea in the three body problem books. And I don't want to spoil too much. But the, the idea is we know that humanity is here on Earth because of the impact that humanity has had that life has had on planet Earth. And what the three body problem says in the in the, the third book is, what if you take that idea and apply it to the whole universe? How, if you looked in the right way, how could you see the impact of life across the entire universe? What is the universal equivalent of a are we living in a clear cut is I guess the way I would describe it as 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 considered by the three body problem. It's an interesting idea. You should definitely uh, you should definitely check it out. More questions in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons, Eric Ferringer, Brian Stanky, Joel Watson, Anthony Albens, Mark Carbonaro, TRS and the rest of our 958 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Chains nine, will dark energy ever get strong enough to tear apart black holes? Maybe. Dark energy is this mysterious force that was discovered back in 1998. That was a big surprise. And it turns out the universe is not slowing down as the mutual gravity of everything is pulling it together. But in fact, it is accelerating. It is if the analogy I always like to use, you take a ball, you throw it up in the air, what you'd expect is the ball is going to come back down to your hand. And you can measure the force of gravity by figuring out how long it takes for the ball to go up and come back down to your hand. Now imagine you threw the ball up in the air, and it just accelerated away off into space. That would be surprising. You'd be like, that was not what I expected. And that is what the discovery of dark energy was. It's, it's mind blowing. So the question is, is dark energy consistent? Is it the same strength? Is it some repulsive force that is appearing in every cubic meter of space? And as you get more space, you get more dark energy, but it's constant. Or is the strength of the dark energy increasing? And if the strength of the dark energy is increasing, then in theory, you'll have this situation where, in fact, the power of the dark energy is so strong that it starts to tear galaxies apart. Because right now a galaxy is held together by its mutual gravity, and it's stronger than the dark energy, but maybe one day the dark energy will be stronger, and then galaxies will be torn apart, and then star systems will be torn apart, and then planets will be torn apart, and then black holes will be torn apart. And eventually every possible thing in the universe will be torn apart. And that's this idea of the big rip. And the answer right now is, we don't know. Um, there's no reason to believe that it is changing over time that it is increasing. But there's no but but the measurement for dark energy hasn't been done with a level of precision to know an answer to that. But we will get an answer in just a couple of years. So the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is kind of like a twin of the Hubble Space Telescope, one of its jobs is going to be to measure the strength of dark energy over time. And if we can tell, oh, dark energy back in the early universe and more recently is exactly the same, then we can feel really comfortable that the strength of the dark energy isn't increasing. But if in fact, dark energy was 
less in the past and more today, then yeah, we're le leading towards that big rip scenario for the future. How does that make you feel? Does it make you feel like, oh, no, my black holes are going to be torn apart at an atomic level? That makes me feel sad, existential. It's not weird. Like it's all going to happen long after we're dead. And yet, to know that our universe is going to be torn apart at an atomic level, as opposed to cool down to the background temperature of the universe. But one gives us more time than the other. I don't know. It's funny. Random user. How do you feel knowing that we won't be around to see how we progress as a species? Sad. Feel super sad. I mean, well, I mean, I see if feel sad for all of you who are going to die, I'm going to get a robot body, I will live to the end of the universe and, and remember it all. But I find the progress, the technological progress, the, the changes in humanity exciting. And I, you know, like, obviously, we have our challenges, we have climate change, we have, uh, fascism popping up in places around the world, we have wars, there's all kinds of hardships. And yet, there's a lot of stuff to be excited about, about the future that I'm just like, like a, like a phone, like just what a like a, right? Like a phone that you hold in your hand that lets you take pictures and communicate with with anyone on Earth. It's amazing. And when you think about some of the breakthroughs, especially ones that can limit suffering, in the future is is pretty exciting to me. So yeah, I think in general, like people always ask me like, would you like to go back in time? Or would you like to go forward in time, I'm like forward in time? You know, like assuming there isn't some nuclear holocaust, I would love to see what the future holds. I mean, when you think about technology like GPT three, which is already able to write and communicate with you in surprisingly human like levels, what's that going to be in 20 years? I mean, you're going to be interacting with a with an AI, it's going to be so weird, crazy. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, all the future missions that are happening, all of the telescopes that are getting built, all of the exploration, all the new discoveries, all the just everything. Yeah, I wish I could live in the future. But I also know that everybody, I guess, has to feel that way. And when I think about my dad, you know, he was there for the Apollo landings, and he was excited about the shuttle and and he still follows space and stuff. And so I've got, you know, I arrived 30 years after he did. And so we just see a different snapshot of humanity's progress. But it, it is interesting to think about how we experience change compared to people who for their life for their entire life was exactly the same as their parents for thousands, tens of thousands of years. That's the way humanity, it's the way civilization progressed. And yet it's only recently that we become accustomed to things changing quickly. And yeah, I find it exciting. Daniel Bray, if you could accelerate to the speed of light, wouldn't time pass as we approach it? But theoretically, if you could go light speed, could you go back in time? Wanted to ask smart people. So the first thing to understand is you can't go faster than the speed of light, you can't go the speed of light, and you can't go faster than the speed of light. So I solved all of your hypotheticals just right there, that none of this is possible. You know, as the laws of physics as we understand them. But let's say you did find a source of unicorn tears, and you were able to fire up your unicorn tear drive, and you were able to go the speed of light. And so if you punch in, if you take the equations for relativity for time dilation, and you punch in that your velocity is the speed of light, then the amount of time that passes is zero, it essentially cancels out the amount of time that passes. And so you would start at your beginning location, you would turn on the unicorn to your drive, you would then appear instantaneously at your destination, and you would have experienced no time. Now, people watching you in your ship fly by, they would see you moving at the speed of light. But from your perspective, now here's where it gets weird. If you put in say, twice the speed of light, well, now that turns the time duration into a negative number. And so you would you would start at your starting location, you would turn on your unicorn tear drive, you would travel at twice the speed of light, and you would arrive before you left. That's weird. Um, and I don't even know what people would see. But the point being that you would then be there telling yourself, meeting yourself, and congratulating yourself on a successful journey before you left. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense. 
And that's just, that's because that's the, if you want to do the math for time dilation, that's what you get. And so as soon as you start trying to use the laws of physics as we understand them and try to put in the things that the laws of physics say you can't do, you get nonsense coming out of the equations. So uh, we're going to need different physics. HQ cart, how would the Earth lose its orbit around the sun? The Earth is orbiting around the sun, it's actually in perfect balance, the gravity of the sun is pulling it inward, the speed of the Earth, the momentum of the Earth going around the sun is pulling it outward. And you get these two opposite forces that are in perfect balance. And so unless anything ever causes anything new to happen, then the Earth would orbit around the sun forever. But there are things that are causing things to happen that are new. Um, you've of course got the various interactions with all the other planets in the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, mostly Jupiter is causing most of the impact. And so you can imagine tiny perturbations in Earth's orbit, adding up over time that eventually, it gets kicked out of the solar system. And the theory is in like, a 100 billion years, Jupiter will actually kick all of the planets out of the solar system, except itself, it'll just be it and the sun. So that's one way. The other way is if the Earth experienced some kind of drag. So at some point in the far future, the sun is going to expand as a red giant, it's probably not going to consume the Earth. But let's say that it did, then the outer atmosphere of the sun would expand out to the point that the Earth would be passing through the atmosphere would be experiencing to be bumping into all this, the particles of the sun's outer atmosphere, and it would cause dragon it would spiral inward and be consumed by the sun. So that's really kind of it. Um, some sort of interaction with the other planets that would kick it out of the solar system or the sun expanding to the point that the Earth would be consumed by falling through its atmosphere. Liquid flames. Has there been a design proposal or daydream for a scope larger than J dub? That's what the kids called James Webb, right? So I'm sure you're familiar with this name Louvoir. This was the large ultraviolet optical infrared observatory. And it was going to be a nine to 15, maybe bigger meter telescope. And then on the most recent decadal survey, it was merged together with this other mission called Habex. So they're calling it like Lubex, I think is sort of the current term, which is just like a, you know, a placeholder eventually get a real name, and it would be a James Webb size telescope with a star shield that would be able to block out the light from other stars so we could see the planets. And maybe it would be in a different wavelength category. So that's the only concrete plan. It's not even a concrete plan, like like, we're still in the dreaming phase of this space telescope. There's nothing bigger in the works right now. But in theory, Starship is going to be launching in a couple of months. And when it does, it's going to prove that a nine meter fairing 150 tons to low Earth orbit is possible. And that totally changes the game for what's possible in terms of large space telescopes. And the idea that I like the best that's being considered is essentially a space based construction of a telescope like the International Space Station, you know, the International Space Station was built in parts. Well, you can imagine future space telescopes built in parts up in orbit, where you send up some chunks, and they form the main mirror, and you send up some other chunks, and it's the secondary mirror and the bus and the solar panels and all that kind of stuff. And eventually you end up with a much bigger space telescope. And maybe you put those pieces inside Starship, and you get something that's even bigger. So right now, everything is just in the dreaming phase nothing is in the very specifically, this is what we're building next. I, I wish I could tell you something different. All right, those are all the questions this week. Thank you, everyone for joining me. You, remember, you can ask your questions on any video that you see post them in the comments, I see everything. Uh, but you can also come and join us when we do the show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific, and ask your questions, there's follow up questions, good conversation, you should definitely come and hang out with us. All right. And don't forget to put in your code for the question that you thought was the best this week. All right, we'll see you next week. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights and links so you can find out more. Go to university.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. 
Go to university.com slash audio or search for University Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks to all the moderators and a special thanks, as always, to Chad Weber and Nancy Graziano.